Welcome. My name is Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Sharon Harris and Rocco, and we're talking about La Cucina Italiana. More specifically, we're talking about La Cucina di Abruzzo, and the show's called Shepherd's Work. And one of the reasons it's called Shepherd's Work is because there's a huge distinction between the coastline cooking and the cooking of the mountain called the Gran Sasso d'Italia, which, geographically speaking, is right over here. The Puglian Peninsula lets you see it. You know that Emilia Romagna is right here. Below that is Le Marche, and then right here is Abruzzo. It's western frontier being that of Lazio, where Rome is. It's southern and kind of southwestern one. Campania here, Puglia here. The Gran Sasso d'Italia is right here. The coastline, if you're thinking about it, when you talk about the distinction from region to region of fish cookery, it doesn't vary nearly as much because they're still more or less dealing with similar products. As you go from Le Marche down through Abruzzo, past Molise and into Puglia, you'll find that the variation in recipes and style of cooking does not nearly as change as much as the stuff that happens in the mountains where much different things grow in terms of the vegetation as well as different kinds of animals and different kinds of traditions. So we're going to start with a seafood dish, making something called alici di ortona, and then we're going to make two kind of shepherd's dishes from based in the mountains, much further up into the hill, called the Sasso d'Italia. The first dish we're going to take is would-be alice, but we're actually going to use sarde today. And either way, the most important thing to find, if you went to the market and found that they both had anchovies, fresh anchovies, and fresh sardines, you would not choose alici or uh, anchovies because the recipe said so. You would choose the freshest fish and then make the recipe with that because the single most important ingredient in any fish cookery recipe is the actual freshness of that fish itself. So what we've got here are a couple of sardines and the way to do them is you ask your fishmonger to have them scaled for you or scale them for you and he may even or she may even actually break them all the way down if that's what you want and they're very willing to do that. Fishmongers are much more happy to have consistent business and are very willing to do whatever you'd ask them to do but in this case we like to also show you what what we can do. So the trick and simplicity of filleting a fish like this is just Take your knife, run it down, you'll run into the spine there, and just run alongside of it. Now, since they've actually been scaled, the entire thing here is now edible. And a lot of times, what's really good is you take a little piece of fish like this, and you just drizzle it with a little lemon juice, a little extra virgin olive oil, put it in the fridge for a couple hours, and come back, and you have basically the Italian style of ceviche. Then you dress it with a little hot pepper and a little bit of parsley, and you're in business. And that is absolutely delicious. But today, we're going to actually fry these, and we're going to do them in several ways actually two ways. We're going to take the fillets like so, and I've got a bunch here already done, and we're just going to put them together in some of them, and other ones we're just going to toss into this little kind of a solution that allows them to retain their beauty, although we're going to fry them. When you talk about putting something in really high heat that's very delicate, one of the traditional things that cooks like to do is to slightly protect the, fit, the flesh. They're actually going to dredge it in something, whether it be just flour, it may also be something as elaborate as what we're going to use, which is actually breadcrumbs, eggs, and flour. Now, half of these, what we're going to do is take something, and this is something you may be surprised to see, but we're actually going to mix a little bit of fish and a little bit of cheese. And although I've talked about this not being at all acceptable in Italy many, many times, what I've mostly referred to is the grating kind of cheeses that go over pastas. When you talk about something linguine with scampi or spaghetti with clams or anything with a very delicate shellfish and a very intense cheese, you'll find that that mixture is something that will overpower any potential for the flavor of the fish to come through. We don't want that to happen. But in this case, we're having a very strong fish and a very light cheese. This is just a very simple sheep's milk ricotta that I've watered a little bit down along the edge with just a thin bit of water and what we're going to do is actually stuff these guys like so with a little bit of that ricotta and this is absolutely okay to do so I'm gonna put them on like that and put them on like that and put it on like that and then we're gonna create kind of our protector so we have the flour here then we have regular eggs and we're just going to beat them up and what they're gonna do is kind of protect the fish in the enrollment of those actual breadcrumbs. Now, breadcrumbs, of course, is always a hot issue. Should you buy the one in the blue can? Don't buy the one in the blue can. Make your own. Get any kind of fresh bread, anything from even, even just regular bread from the grocery store. But if you can find a good bakery that makes a good bread, that's a better way to do it. Then you just chop it into cubes, throw it in the food processor, and if you want this kind of rustic look, you leave the crust on, and you also leave them in this larger size. If you wanted to continue grinding it, they'll get a little smoother, and that's all right, too. It would just be for something else. And I'm looking for something quite rustic here. So now I'm going to dredge them like so. I'm going to do the ones 
that are just plain first. And then I'm going to take the ones that are a little bit more delicate. That is the ones to say the ones that need a little bit more handling. And I'm going to do them one by one. And I'm not looking to close this off. And in fact, you're going to see the way that we dredge it like this in the egg and stuff is going to actually help them adhere together once they're in the infernal bath of hot oil that is our deep fryer over here. Mary, don't you think the flour step's very important? It definitely is to yeah. helping this yeah. whole thing to adhere. If you just dipped it straight in the egg, I mean, you could actually dip it straight in the egg and then cook it in a nonstick pan, and that would work. But the flour step really kind of brings the whole thing together, and it's going to make sure that you have less of what we call a window for error. In the restaurant business, we're always looking to limit our window of error. That is to say... Back the deck. Exactly. Make sure that you have absolutely no chance to mess things up because often in a restaurant business, you don't expect to be busy or you're pretending you're not going to be that busy. And in fact, you're going to be really busy. So you want to make sure that the cooks that are working with you have very little opportunity to make mistakes. You've actually limited their amount of opportunity to make mistakes. So now I've got them all kind of set. And you could do this in advance. You wouldn't want to fry this in advance for this particular dish. Although to make a scapeche, it's very traditional in Italy to often enough fry the things in advance and then allow them to cool and then serve them with kind of a vinegar. What we're going to do is then now just drop them in the oil. I have extra virgin olive oil. When you're frying at home, make sure you don't fill your pan more than half full because it tends to bubble up sometimes and we certainly don't want a home fire. I'm going to drop in the ones that are filled first. When we come back, I'll show you how we make a quick little sauce and then we're going to make a beautiful little shepherd style pasta. So please, stay with us. Welcome back. Now they're just crisply fried. They're absolutely ready to go. The first thing we do when we take fried food out of the fryer is season it a little bit with some salt. And then I'm going to create a little improvised dipping sauce. Hold on, guys. I'll have something for you in just a sec. Little red chilies. This isn't exactly purely tradition, but it does make a heck of a lot of sense. I like to take a little bit of red chilies. I season them with a little salt. These are pretty spicy. I add about five or six, maybe a quarter cup of red wine vinegar, a little bit of black pepper, and then some extra virgin olive oil. And we have kind of like a little red chili mignonetti kind of thing that, although this isn't going to be in any traditional cookbooks in Abruzzo, they certainly might eat it that way because the people of Abruzzo are forte e gentile. That is to say strong, but very nice. And what that kind of describes, first of all, their culture and the way that they like to do things, but it also describes their food, which they like pretty spicy, but not really hot, just aggressively spiced. If you're familiar with any of the geography of Abruzzo, L'Aquila, a town in the northern part of it, just below, kind of to the southwest of the Gran Sasso, in its high plains as it comes down from there, is the only place where they produce incredible saffron in all of Italy. And of course, the Italians think it's much better than the Spanish, blah, 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 blah. But it just lets you understand that there's an incredible amount of kind of very spiced food going on in Abruzzo, and that's one of the things. Go ahead and pass them around, take them, taste them, whatever you want, guys. Now, the next thing we're going to make is some fresh sausage. What I have here, and we're going to make a pasta out of this. This is actually pasta in the style of the pastor. And when you talk about il pastore, it refers to the pastor, the shepherd, as opposed to the religious shepherd who also guards and watches the flock. And one of the most important things about a good sausage that you have to understand is that there has to be a certain percentage of fat in it. And what that does is it gives it a lot of flavor. So I have some fat back here that I removed the skin from. Here I have some pretty lean ground pork. And to that pork, I'm going to add about 30 to 40 percent pure, unadulterated fat. But half of that fat is going to come in the form of this pancetta, which is what we love to put in our sausages because it takes care of a lot of the issues in terms of getting it seasoned right. So we're going to drop them in like so. And these meat grinders are very easy to have around the house. And one of the nice things about a meat grinder like this is it really allows you to kind of personalize your meat. And making sausage is something that they're really high on in Italy, but it's not something that they consider anything special. This is something that is a regular part of people's, you know, not every day, but certainly their culture. They like to make their own sausage. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some ginger and just run it through the grinder with a little bit of garlic. Would they use uh, ginger in Abruzzo in Ireland? Absolutely they would. And it's strange, strangely enough, it's wherever you find seaports that you'll find 
perhaps things that you might not consider traditional to that region having been actually brought in and used as part of that region. Probably the largest, the most important example of that would be Venice, where you start to see a lot of the spices from the east because when Marco Polo left Venice, he obviously came back to Venice, bringing a lot of things from the far east. So ginger and saffron and cardamom and all of those kind of what we consider either Middle Eastern or Asian spices are included in a lot of that. And Pescara being a, a pretty important port town, although not nearly as important as Brindisi or um, Venezia, has also some of that culture. When you're in and around those kind of port towns, you found that a lot of these interesting flavors, particularly very vibrant ones like ginger, something very different, is something you'll start to find in a lot of the traditional regional cooking. I'm gonna add a pretty aggressive amount of hot chili flakes, and then we're going to season it. Now, the one thing that a lot of people don't understand in terms of sausage, in as well as not understanding the fat content, is that it takes a pretty aggressive hand with salt and pepper to make this come out to be really, really good. Now, if you didn't want to make your own sausage, you could go to the butcher or you could go to the whatever grocery store you go to and just ask them for regular sausage and then pull it out of the casings. Because in this case, you don't want it mixed in with the casing. You want to have it out. So what I'm going to do so is I'm going to start. This isn't going to go into a casing. This it's isn't, a but free form it, sausage. This is a free form sausage that we're going to actually use, kind of to create a loose and runny ragu okay. based on this sausage and ricotta that we're eventually going to mix with this. When you talk about something in the style of the shepherd or the pecorayo, it's it's mixing whatever they have. So they have the animals, and they also have the ricotta that comes from the animals, and they mix it up. And you're going to see it's this very interesting, kind of rich and creamy, delicious sauce. Now what we're going to do with this sausage now that it's mixed up like this, and I haven't spent a lot of time making it completely homogenous, but if you were going to stuff it into skins, and you could very much take this very same machine, put on the long tube, put on the casings and stuff it and then tie it and hold that sausage, you would want to make sure that it was completely homogenous. You would spend a lot of time actually stirring it so that you have it all consistent because you don't want to have in the same way that you don't want a stuffed pasta to have one bite with a lot of something and not a lot of the other thing. It's the same thing with sausage. But since this is going to eventually just break down and become part of the pasta sauce, it's not that important. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sausage and drop it in here and just cook it until a lot of that fat kind of renders out. Now we're going to pour most of that away, but the fact that it's there is what gives this a lot of flavor. Now while this is cooking, and this is only going to take five or six minutes, we're actually going to drop our ziti, and then get ready to mix the whole thing together because when this is about two-thirds of the way cooked, I'm going to drain out that fat and add this beautiful fresh ricotta to continue with our pasta al pecorayo. So please, stay with us. Welcome back. Now I've just drained a little bit of that fat out that has actually come out from our beautiful sausage mix. And to that pan, I'm going to add about four tablespoons of beautiful sheep's milk ricotta. Mario, isn't ricotta a byproduct from cheese making? Absolutely. What you do is you make your first cheese, wh whatever animal it is, if it was sheep's milk or cow's milk, if it was mozzarella or parmigiano, the whole thing is that you make your first cheese and then what's separated is the curds, which you make your cheese out of, and then there's the whey, which is what you're going to make your ricotta out of. And tradition would have it, particularly in this area, that you would take that whey, that secondary milk, or that secondary kind of a liquid, and just stir it with a cardoon a cut cardoon leaf, and that cut cardoon plant, a stalk of it, would actually separate it again, and you would take that separated stuff, and it would separate again. And what comes to the top is this fresh ricotta, which they don't even call cheese in Italy. It's not even referred to as cheese. It's called ricotta, and it's its own special product. And that's exactly how you make it. It's very simple. Wherever they make cheese in any DOC, they're required by a certain portion of law to actually make the ricotta a couple times a week, particularly Parmigiano Reggiano. Now to make this dish, and I've crowded my pan just a little bit, that's all right. What we're gonna do is just very delicately stir the sausage and the ziti together to form one beautiful thing dressed very much like a salad. And you can tell already that the reason this dish is gonna be so good is because there isn't a heck of a lot of sauce. It's a very austere thing that's just gonna come together when we actually bring it to the table. And then we kind of... It smells so good. Yeah. 
And this is all just fresh sausage we just made now. Now again, there's no reason to be afraid of buying sausage and making a dish like this, but it's absolutely perfect, just like it is. Now the next dish we're gonna make, and I'm just gonna put a little bit more, a little bit of scamorza over it, and by all means, Rocco, go ahead and serve it up. Now this next dish is from Teramo, which is at the base of the, it's actually not even at the base, it's considered a mountain village, and it's up into the Gran Sasso d'Italia, it's the, north, the furthest most north peninsula of, I mean peninsula, the furthest most north region or provincia of all of Abruzzo. And it's a very simple dish, but it's got a lot of interesting things on it that work really well. The first thing you want to do is take a chicken and just cut it into pieces, and your butcher will gladly do this for you. But the trick to doing it is making sure you do it on a separate board because everyone's all worried about salmonella and uh, salmonella and you want to make sure that you don't get anything messed up with raw chicken. So we'll take these pieces and we'll cut them in. Basically, I like to cut the chicken into eight pieces, but sometimes I only cut it into six. We're going to remove the backbone and save that for making a little bit of broth. And then we're going to take the breast plate and just go straight down it like so. Dude, this rocks. Is that delish? So good. Outstanding. Why, thank you. Mm. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take one thing I like to do with chicken is make sure that you take the wing piece off with a little bit of the breast so the wing doesn't seem so forlorn and so needy of the hot sauce that most wings are served with. Then what we're going to do is we're going to season it pretty aggressively and then get it in a pan with extra virgin olive oil. Now in Abruzzo, we're cooking with extra virgin olive oil even when we fry, and that's kind of the trademark of the whole region, just as it is in Puglia, just as it is in Le Marche, just as it is in Lazio, and as it often enough is in Campania. So we're going to get our pieces in there, and with this really hot pan, I'm kind of crowding it traditional to what I always do, but we're not going to worry about it, because as you'll see in a second, it's going to continue to brown very, very well. I'm going to get rid of that dirty chicken board, rinse off my hands, and now start to deal with the rest of the ingredients in the dish. Now being near Lazio, celery is probably one of the unsung heroes of all of Roman style cooking, but as we get closer we get further east from Rome, you'll start to see a lot of those things are still very much part of the culture. So we're going to take some celery. We're also going to take some red hot chilies. These are fresh chilies. You can just use the dried if you want, but traditional to this dish are the fresh chilies that grow at the base of the, uh, the Gran Sasso d'Italia and have a particularly piquant flavor. They're not too hot. If you want to reduce the heat, you can actually not use the seeds, which we're going to do in this case. We're going to take a few peppercorns, and then we're going to take a couple of other ingredients. Now this is dandelions. They're absolutely delicious, cooked or raw. You'll find that they change their entire game if you cook the heck out of them as opposed to if you just wilt them. And I love the flavor of them and they're particularly fond of them cooked almost to dust in this region. And we love to use the stems as well. But what we're doing in this dish is we're setting aside everything so that once we get our chicken brown, we're going to assemble this kind of a braising thing. And that's really kind of the, the trademark technique of any braising is to brown this and then add anything that you want to bring flavor to whatever you're braising and then cook it all together slowly with just a little bit of liquid, not a heck of a lot of liquid. Now, another thing that we're using is this beautiful piece of mortadella. Now, mortadella is also made, although everyone's famous, is familiar with the mortadella from Bologna and in and around Emilia Romagna, mortadella is also made in Teramo because these beautiful pigs kind of live along the outside of this lake called Campo Tosto in the northwest portion of Abruzzi. And the way that it's a little bit different is it's a little bit drier and a little bit more seasoned. So we're going to take pieces like that in pretty large pieces and they're actually going to braise with the chicken and what you're going to see is they're going to kind of melt and they'll yield this kind of beautiful porky flavor to the entire stew without it being too much of a challenge. Mary, what's all that colorful garnish in the uh, mortadella? Those are actually pistachios, mm. and we love those. And that's very traditional to a lot of mortadella, but you can also get mortadella without that, and that's actually one of the good things. Now we're going to take out our chicken pieces now that we've browned them, and we're going to hold them in a bowl while we create our braising atmosphere. And the way we're going to do that is take all of these delicious things, and toss them in the pot. We're going to start with our celery and our chilies. We're going to put in our mortadella. We're going to put in our dandelions because we want them to get hammered. And then we're going to take about a half a bottle of red wine. We're going to season the greens because we want them to give it up real quickly. Take about a half a bottle of red wine. Drop it in like so. And then once that comes up to the boil, which is happening very quickly because our pan was so hot, we're going to replace the chickens in here, the chicken pieces, bring the whole thing up to a boil, then lower the heat and simmer it for 45 minutes. 
When we come back, I'll show you a tiny little trick that we're going to use to finish this dish. So stay with us. Here we are in Abruzzo and digging on the polo. Ciao. Welcome back. Well, we've got our chicken in the style of teramo, braised beautifully. Again, this is another case where we'll probably save this liquid, cook it with a little bit of spaghetti later on with grandma for the late midnight snack or tomorrow's lunch. We want to make sure we get all of that beautiful mortadella and those beautifully bitter dandelions and chilies together. And then the trick is to take that celery, we take the leaves that we had left on the celery stock and to finish the dish we love to take something raw that's included in the dish cooked so we'll take these beautiful celery leaves and a little bit of celery like that of the very inner hearts we'll mix it in the bowl like so with a little bit of parsley then we'll dress it with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil some lemon juice and a little bit of salt and what we're going to get here is kind of the complex taste of both the raw and the cooked. And what that does for us is that raw, I mean, that cooked vegetables that are in there have this kind of muted flavor. The raw stuff that we're putting on top of here have this very light and lively flavor. And that kind of a combination of the two gives you the spectrum of flavor that makes a very interesting dish, which is exactly what we love so much about Italian cooking. I want to thank you guys for being here. You made it a heck of a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here. And I hope to see you eating in the style of Abruzzi, as well as on the next Molto Mario channel.